All right, so welcome everyone to a roundtable from uh, the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University. My name is Dr. Margaret Hansen. I'm an assistant professor in the department and I'll be the moderator for this roundtable. Uh, the title of the roundtable is Democratic Erosion and the Rise of the Far Right in the US and Global Perspective. Um, so this is a post midterm election roundtable. Uh, so concern has grown in recent years about the future of democracy globally uh, by Freedom House estimates, for example, eight in 10 people in the world today live in either partly free or not free countries. Um, and even longstanding democracies that are were thought to have been secure have uh, some of them have experienced backsliding. And frequently in these countries, threats to democracy have come uh, from the far right and have involved eroding existing democratic institutions and norms, such as judicial independence, freedom of the press, uh, and competitive elections from within. And this is not to equate all right-wing parties or movements with democratic erosion. Conservative parties are, of course, an integral part of democracy around the world. But our focus here today is on the commonalities between movements that have sought, in many cases, successfully to, again, to undermine democracy from within. Um, and today's roundtable places experts on democratic erosion in the global American and Eastern European context in conversation with one another to provide insight into this trend against the backdrop of the recent U.S. midterm elections, where many candidates promoted false claims of widespread electoral fraud. And we're lucky to have four experts joining us today. Uh, I'll be introducing them in the order that they will also be uh, speaking initially. So Dr. Stephen Haggard is the Lawrence and Sally Krauss Distinguished Professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. His research interests center on the international and comparative political economy of development with particular emphasis on East Asia. And he's a noted expert on many topics, but among them transitions to and from democratic rule. Dr. Fabian Neuner is Assistant Professor of Political Science in the School of Politics and Global Studies at ASU. He studies political psychology, political behavior, and public opinion, both in the US and in comparative contexts. And his research examines key dynamics in political psychology, including biased information processing, framing, and emotions. Uh, Dr. Lenka bushtakova siroki is Associate Professor in European Union and Comparative East European Politics at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on party politics, voting behavior, clientelism, and state capacity, with special reference to Eastern Europe. She's an expert on far-right politics in that region and has received awards for her work on the topic. Dr. Anna Meyer-Rose is Assistant Professor of Global Studies in the School of Politics and Global Studies at ASU. Her research focuses on the ways in which international organizations and other aspects of globalization uh, both condition and also create challenges for domestic democratic institutions. Um, so I'd like to, before we get started, just quickly preview the format of the roundtable. Each speaker, in the order they were introduced, will give an opening statement of about three to five minutes. This will be followed by a question or two from the moderator, and we will then open things up for audience questions. Uh, you can type those questions into the Q&A at any point during the event and look forward to an informed, engaged discussion. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn things over to Dr. Haggard to kick us off to talk about the global context. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I really appreciate you, you doing this. Let me um, just put up a few slides. I'm, I'm going to try to keep to the three to five minute limit for sure. But uh, Anna asked me if I could do something that would tee up the discussion in terms of global trends. So I thought I'd do so with just some simple descriptive data that's drawn from a number of the projects that we have in the political science community that are trying to track you know, the course of democracy and, and put some metrics on it. So let me start with a little bit of good news. 
Um, and this might be familiar to many of you if you've taken an introductory course on these topics, but this is a picture of the state of democracy in the world going all the way back more or less to the origins, you know, which were triggered by the American and French revolutions. But I really wanna focus on this era here in the 70s and, and just draw your attention to this blue line which reflects democracies this red line, which uh, reflects autocracies, but then something I want to draw your attention to is this intermediate category of what have been called hybrid or competitive authoritarian regimes. And notice there's this dramatic increase in democracy in the world that begins in Southern Europe in the 70s, in Spain and Portugal and spreads to the Southern cone of Latin America and dramatic developments in the Philippines and Korea. Uh, in the 80s. And then, of course, you have the boost to democracy, which is given by the collapse of the Soviet Union, and particularly its control over Eastern Europe, that one of our colleagues here will talk about. But I just want to focus on the persistence of these competitive authoritarian regimes. You know, this, this was a type of regime which I think many of us thought would gradually diminish and disappear. But you know, through 2017, and I'll show you some more recent data, they've proven surprisingly robust. And this is one of the areas of concern, the fact that even if autocracy as a whole is declining, this type of regime is remaining in place. Now, um, if, we, if we draw even finer categories here and take the data forward, uh, and this is from a very nice paper at Democratization by Buza and her colleagues. I'm going to make one further distinction, not only between autocracies uh, and competitive autocracies, but also between different types of democracy, and particularly what we call uh, electoral democracies, which meet some minimal threshold in which it's possible for oppositions to contend for office and elections are reasonably free and fair from liberal democracies in which in addition to uh, the integrity of the electoral system, you also see checks in place on executive discretion, you know, typically from the judiciary and other independent bodies, and also robust guarantee of basic political rights, speech, freedom of assembly, association, uh, with the media playing a particularly important role. And here you see one of the developments that's really been sort of troubling over the last five years, as well as the last 20, which as you can see, you know, we still have this sharp decline in the number of autocracies in the world, but we see an increase in liberal democracies peaking and then showing this gradual retreat over the last five or seven years, and more electoral democracies, but fewer liberal ones. And again, with this continued march of, uh, of electoral autocracies, which, which you know, pose a particular uh, challenge. Uh, if anyone wants these slides, I'm happy to send them. But let me, let me close out by just uh, identifying a concept that I think we'll be talking about for the rest of the webinar. And that's this idea of backsliding. And if we look at, at the history of, of transitions uh, from democratic rule historically, the standard way in which that occurred was through the military coup. And these were quite common actually throughout the post-war period. But something strange happened over the last decades which is a process of uh, backsliding from democratic rule, which is undertaken by duly elected, that is fairly elected executives, whether the system is parliamentary or presidential. And this is done by essentially abusing executive discretion, undertaking attacks on horizontal checks and the judiciary, and even at the margin underlying the integrity uh, undermining the integrity of the electoral system. Now, let me again make one, uh, you know, start with one piece of good news. Um, th this is just sort of some democracy scores from a very important project called the VDEM project. And notice that if we look at the starting point here, we see that, 
you know, countries like Brazil and the United States and Hungary are, are you know, very democratic. You know, they're liberal democratic countries. And, and nonetheless, you see these slight derogations from democratic, uh, the prior democratic path over the last four or five years in the United States. Um, and then you see even sharper derogations in uh, countries like Brazil, which recently had an election, which uh, is likely to reverse that trend, or we hope reverse that trend. And then you see countries like Hungary, which um, Alenka will talk about, where you know there's been a quite substantial decline in the level of democracy right in the heart of Europe. And we've seen this as well in India since the election of the BJP in 2014 and then reelected in 2019. And then in the case of Venezuela, which is particularly interesting, this is a country which was considered a, a fairly consolidated democracy by Latin American standards up until the election of Chavez. And it's seen this dramatic decline where there's no longer simply a departure from liberal democratic rule, but from democracy altogether. And as we know, this has been one of the uh, catastrophes of the entire Western hemisphere is the crisis in Venezuela, which has generated as many refugees as the Syrian civil war quietly. It's, it's underappreciated, you know, what a challenge this has been for the region. So I'll just close by, by showing one set of indicators that I think demonstrates some of the challenges globally. This is from Freedom House, and it's trying to track changes in civil liberties and political rights over time, and just simply showing the number of countries that are seeing an improvement in the quality of those rights and those that are seeing uh, a weakening. And again, what you can see since 2005 is that while there's a lot of churning, you know, there are countries that are improving, you know, think of an Ecuador perhaps, or, you know, Slovakia, but then you see a number of countries that uh, where there are these retreats, often subtle, often incremental, often slow moving of political rights and liberties that are moving away from what we might consider a liberal democratic ideal. And some of that, interestingly, has come during the COVID period when COVID restrictions were used to, to uh, in some cases, to shut down politics. I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Haggard. Um, now we'll turn things over to Dr. Neuner, uh, who will discuss what we mean by democratic erosion in the US context and give us a little roundup uh, of the midterm elections in that respect. Yes, thank you, Margaret. So I wanted to start off with um, why we have this roundtable just after the election. And I think, of course, the roundtable was scheduled before the election or the results were known. And so it's good to have some introspection and to try and evaluate um, today's roundtable in light of what occurred. And I think um, the, the main questions really were in this roundtable, would the, or in this election, uh, how would the results go? And what would happen to, on the one hand, candidates who we often sometimes call election deniers. So that goes hand in hand with January 6th and the certification of the last presidential election. But um, candidates who were against the initial certification of the results in 2020 and were campaigning on sometimes anti-democratic platforms um, challenging the results of the previous election. So that was one um, concern that came into this election. And the other concern was rising political violence, which in many ways is um, connected, but this question that people seem more likely nowadays to um, be in, maybe not endorse, but to accept political violence or threats against leaders or just simply people from other political parties. And so the good news um, at first is that what happened in this election seems to potentially go against the trend that some people may have expected. We saw almost no um, political violence. Where we saw it, we saw very little um, and non-systematic political violence. So there was one or two news articles about um, individual acts of violence, but nothing systematic or, or large scale during the election. Um, in Arizona, for instance, we could think about um, not just violence, but um, acts around that. So for instance, a question might come up with um, election observers and Dropbox monitoring in Arizona, which clearly um, was potentially meant to um, intimidate voters but none of those um, acts 
ended up with, with true aggression or with violence. So that is the good news. Um, the second good news is that um, many of those candidates who were election deniers, um, not just uh, losing elections, but they lost elections gracefully. And so on both sides, we have seen um, people losing their races, be it at the governor level or the congressional level, um, sometimes after a little bit more time as in the past, but traditionally we have seen people uh, concede when they have lost election races. Now there's some few exceptions to that. Um, one of the big ones that happened today was uh, Adam Laxalt in Nevada um, conceded. Um, I think as far as last time I checked uh, the Arizona governor's race, we've not heard a concession yet. But those are the things we're really looking for because we think about democratic transitions and the importance of democratic stability is the peaceful turnover of power. And um, when we talk about democratic erosion in the US, a big part of this is how are we dealing with um, of loss? How do losers deal with losing? Do they endorse the peaceful transfer of power or do they engage in um, acts that might rile up their supporters to question the election? And we still see some of that on the margins, which is important to note. So we still see some candidates um, arguing that they lost because of election fraud or irregularities. And that is important in, in the broader context of the questions about democratic erosion, because democratic erosion in the United States really happens at the state level. Elections are administered at the state level, and there's good research showing that where we have democratic backsliding, it really happens um, to begin with at the state level. So Jake Brumbach's work, Laboratories Against Democracy, really charts out how parties have become nationalized, but are fighting these battles over um, voting rights or over election administration rules at the state level. And so what do we mean by this? We mean, um, we think about fighting over rules that might disenfranchise people, uh, growing districts that might lead to um, voters being disenfranchised uh, or being less policy responsive. And while that happens, uh, it is important to separate that from political violence. So I think today we might focus on, on, on two aspects. On the one hand, kind of democratic erosion in terms of um, political elites, question the political system, question the media undermining um, elections. But then on the other hand, also what happens at the mass level with potential violence. Um, and I'll leave it at that, but I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, and next, we'll hear from Dr. Linko uh, Siroki. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me being here again. So I'll just make a few remarks and I look forward to the discussion. So in terms of democratic erosion, and I would like to emphasize resilience as well in these brief remarks, two dates are crucial, or actually one date and then a follow-up date. 2010 is the date when Orban won elections and he was able to consolidate and solidify his power with a remarkable victory this spring. And then in 2015, the Law and Justice Party won elections for the second time in Hungary and they have been in power since then. Next year, 2023, there are, there are going to be parliamentary elections uh, in Poland uh, again. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen. There is a possibility that Law and Justice Party might lose uh, or might not be able to form a majority um, or, a, or a coalition that would give it majority. And I think if that happens, and I again, I cannot predict future, I think it might mark an era of sort of the, the end of backsliding in Eastern Europe. So I think one thing to really keep in mind is that in some way, Hungary is a huge exception to the rule. And with Poland, you know, depending on what happens in 2023, um, we really don't know, but Poland is not yet Hungary and Hungary is exceptional. If we think about very recent elections in Eastern Europe, we have seen um, a refusal of illiberal leaders. So illiberal leaders recently lost in Slovenia, Bulgaria, now GERB is back, Bulgaria is more complicated, Slovakia, Czechia, Baltics actually do not have any serious episodes of backsliding. And with the exception perhaps of Vucic in Serbia, which is a complicated story, I cannot think of any other Eastern European leader in the, you know, in the post, um, in the in the Central and Eastern Europe that would amass uh, power comparable to Orban. So I think that if you if we think about some if you look at some scores from BDEM, for example, between 2018 and 2021, 20, and you look at scores in Europe, the biggest gains in democratic scores are in Eastern Europe. So Slovakia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova, Montenegro, and Ukraine. This is of course before the war have improved a little bit, not by much. And these scores were taken be, be, before elections in. Um, 
in Czechia and Slovenia. So the Slovenian elections were, were, were really important and the Czech elections too. And so I think, you know, maybe I am a bit too hopeful and excited about the elections outcome in the United States and Arizona, but I think in some way it's possible that the, the deterioration and the, this big dive um, has stalled. I think we see a lot of plateau and I think we might be entering an era where the, the deepest decline, you know, Hungary, who knows what's going to happen with the economy, Orban is facing a lot of unrest now, but I think we will enter this era of muddling through and plateauing of imperfect democracy. So nothing dramatic, not nice, but not a complete disaster. I, I want to sort of focus on two more things before I conclude. I think one absolutely fascinating thing about erosion of resilience is people are thinking, what are the conditions under which these countries are able to, to curb erosion a little bit? And surprisingly, people find out that things that were uh, unpopular were, are, are suddenly hot. So fragmentation is good. It used to be the case that everybody complained about fragmentation. Now it seems to be the case that very fragmented and dysfunctional parliamentary systems are actually good because nobody can concentrate power. And also veto points are suddenly very important. So second, uh, you know, second chamber, so the law and justice party doesn't control the Senate, a strong courts. There are still actually some strong independent courts in Eastern Europe. All these veto points, you know, the, the points that can block the executive expansion are, you know, have shown to contribute to resilience. And um, one thing, I mean, I want to mention and sort of circle it back to the United States, what is to me also remarkable about Eastern Europe is that when it, when you think about the drivers of polarization, the drivers of polarization in Eastern Europe and in the United States are more similar. I mean, but maybe Italy is now an exception. Um, to um, if you compare it to Western Europe, so the another huge change that you know that goes hand in hand with backsliding is that the polarization has shifted. Um, from issues of ethnicity, not that ethnicity is not there, but there is a lot of contestation and sophisticated instrumental division of the electorate on issues such as abortion and uh, gay, gay and lesbian rights. So I think in some way, sometimes I, I feel like I'm reliving US when I'm thinking about Poland. Um, and my final point is, I think a war in Ukraine is going to be extremely important for the future of backsliding. Orban is now isolated because the whole coalition of uh, the four Central European countries and the whole coalition between Orban and uh, Kaczynski, uh, Hungary and Poland don't see eye to eye on the issue of Ukraine. Uh, you probably know Poland very supportive of the Ukrainian fight. Orban is uh, dragging his feet. And um, also because Putin uh, is now a complete loser. I mean, he's not finished yet, but let, let's hope that that might happen, uh, you know, with you know, Putin losing any appeal, Russia is no, lo no longer a focal point of illiberalism. And it's possible if Ukraine somehow um, manages to regain some territorial integrity, it, it's absolutely obvious that we might be in a new cycle in which the Western modern of liberal democracy might be um, appealing yet again, because Russia failed, you know, it, it unmasked a, a horrible, brutal regime, Orban is isolated. And I think, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, um, I think everybody is rooting and incredibly inspired by the fight of Ukrainians for uh, for their sovereignty and for their ability to determine their own political future. So I will leave it with that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Soroki. And finally, uh, with opening remarks, Dr. Meyer Rose. All right, thank you. Um, so I was just going to sort of wrap up this discussion and bring it, bring it to another big question that I think all of these trends that we've been talking about raises, and that is basically what has caused this recent wave of democratic backsliding that we're seeing around the world. Um, and so sort of at the domestic level, there have been a number of factors that have been proposed as potential sources of democratic backsliding. Um, on the economic side, a lot of research has looked at things such as economic recession, and in particular the 2008 financial crisis, as well as growing economic inequality as one potential source of these trends that we're seeing. 
Um, another subset of the literature looks at um, sort of the role of political institutions and so um, in particular looking at things such as the sort of failure of traditional political parties, particularly in the West over the last decade or so. And so in this literature, there's um, the argument that a lot of traditional mainstream parties in the West have sort of converged on the same policy platforms when it comes to economic issues. And in some cases, uh, the center left has sort of struggled in Europe in particular, and in some places has um, completely collapsed. And so this has created an opening for these populists and these extremist candidates and political parties uh, that are often associated with these cases of backsliding to come to power and win over voters. And then finally, sort of the third big category of explanations for um, recent democratic backsliding focuses more on the role of identity politics and this rise of culture as one of the main um, dividing issues in the political discourse recently. And of course, um, these trends are often linked to things such as immigration and anti-immigrant sentiment in particular. And so while these are all domestic level factors that have been identified as potential sources of um, backsliding, a lot of the research has really linked, the, linked these outcomes at the domestic level to aspects of globalization in particular. So of course, immigration levels are on the rise as a result of globalization. And there's a lot of research arguing that this growing income inequality that we're seeing around the world can also be attributed to um, globalization and the neoliberal um, global economy that has existed for the last couple of decades in particular. And sort of related to this role of the global economy, there's a lot of work showing that things such as influxes of trade from China and other developing countries, as well as um, job offshoring and other related trends have been another source of why voters in particular are supporting these extremist and these populist candidates that we're seeing coming to power. Um, and so here the argument is that workers and other individuals that feel left behind both economically and culturally by globalization are the ones that are more likely to support these populist candidates. And then in my own work, I've also looked at another how another aspect of globalization might be um, related to these um, causes of backsliding um, in that I look at membership in international organizations in particular. And so here I find that um, membership in some international organizations can serve to increase executive power at the domestic level, but at the same time can also erode domestic institutions such as political parties and legislatures that historically have played this really critical role in acting as a check on executive power. And so this combination of factors might also make states more susceptible to backsliding. So that's kind of the high level, very high level overview of where the literature is today on what has caused this recent trend and these recent cases of backsliding around the world. Um, but then we also, uh, moving for forward, really need to think about what the consequences are going to be as well. And so, of course, there are a number of consequences at the domestic level of backsliding, for example, issues related to citizen control over their governments, but also more broadly, as we were talking about, it's this erosion of liberal democracy in particular, so that can involve um, challenges to minority rights and um, human rights at the domestic level as well in these cases that end up as these sort of illiberal or diminished forms of democracy. Um, but then there's also implications of this backsliding, not just at the domestic level, but also internationally it might have some implications for sort of the international system as a whole moving forward. Um, so for example, we've seen that a lot of these populist leaders focus a lot on nationalism and issues like that. And so we see the rise of protectionism, but there's also evidence um, that these populist leaders are opposed to membership in um, international organizations. So things such as Brexit um, really highlight that in particular. And so as we continue this discussion, I think it's important to keep these um, consequences both domestically and international, um, internationally in mind as we think about um, this trend of democratic backsliding. So I will stop here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have the uh, Q&A open for questions. Um, please uh, feel free to contribute those. Um, and I'll, I guess, kick us off with an initial question about how democratic backsliding in recent years uh, is new or different compared to past reversions to autocracy. Uh, and whether we see any specific regional trends as well. Um, so uh, Dr. Haggard, I know you touched on that briefly in your presentation, but I'll open up the floor for the participants to discuss. 
Yeah, well, this, this was an extremely interesting. And I, I have a lot of questions for Lenka, actually, because I think she said uh, some extremely interesting things about uh, how looking at a particular region can cast light on these on these trends. So let me start with your first question, just about how transitions to uh, authoritarianism have typically occurred. Um, you know, the coup was really the modal way that these uh, transitions occurred previously. Uh, militaries would essentially seize power, uh, displace elected officials, and then either rule by transitioning themselves to putting on, getting out of their uniform and putting on a suit, so to speak, think of Park Chung-hee in, in Korea, or in some cases, uh, running the government in, for an interim period and then passing it off to someone else. But, but backsliding is really completely different because it's, it takes place, as I define the concept at least. I mean, you could interpret the 20th Party Congress in China as an example of an autocracy which is sliding further backwards. But I think that the concept of backsliding is trying to get at a process which takes place within countries that have already achieved a given level of democracy. And here, I just wanna highlight one thing on the ideological front, because we really didn't talk much about ideology. But one feature, I think, of, of populism and, and this, uh, this new uh, backsliding trend is a conception of democracy that's majoritarian. And by that, I mean the idea that elected officials should reflect the will of some people, however those people are defined, and sometimes that's in a restrictive way, but that the executive should not be bound or checked uh, in the ways that we typically think of liberal democracies as operating. So for example, judiciaries are portrayed as unelected bodies that don't reflect the will of the people. Um, and, and rights are seen as intruding on the ability of governments to do what they want with respect to say minority populations. Think of Modi in India, I think is a perfect example of a, of a democracy that has not seen much derogation with respect to the electoral system, but substantial. Uh, violations of, of rights of minorities, including not only, you know, the LGBTQ community and women, but uh, the 200 million Muslims. Um, I think I'm going to pass, because I've talked already too long about, about regional trends, but I'll just note one thing in passing, and that is the coup seems to have come back uh, we've got a number of coups recently um, in Thailand, about five or six years ago in Myanmar, in uh, several African countries, including Mali. Um, so a, a form of transition to authoritarian rule, which we thought was gone, <laughs> seems to have uh, you know, made uh, somewhat of a comeback, at least in a handful of countries. Did anyone else want to chime in on that question? Yeah, I just want to chime in very quickly that to me, what's up, what's, I just want to echo that the majoritarian concept of democracies, I think is the most appealing for me in Eastern Europe. To me, I would take majoritarian democracies over autocracy, you know, I might not like it, but I think that's what we might have to settle for. But for me, in terms of backsliding, I think three issues really stand out that I think um, the early literature couldn't foresee and are surprising. So number one is politicization of courts, which I think might be a global phenomenon, but I, I don't think courts were dispoliticized and weaponized as is a new trend, a new, new tool. And number two, and they're interrelated, is the role of churches and sexuality. I think sort of these two issues really stand out. They are big drivers of democratic erosion, and it's something that hasn't been obvious in the first 20 years of democratic transition. And, you know, these things are related. So I think 
churches, sects, and, and courts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, um, I clicked it, but apparently not hard enough. Uh, so that raises a question with respect that I, um, with respect to populism, which is um, the fact that populism has has been a parallel and uh, contributing trend to these many of these cases of democratic erosion. Um, how does this wave of populism, which we're seeing, compare to uh, the rise of populism in the past, and do we see uh, perhaps distinctions um, between the U.S. and Eastern Europe, or or India, or other or other context? Was that directed to anyone in particular? Or... Uh, look, I'll just I'll just make one short comment on this, and maybe partly to stir debate. I mean, if we think of the way that populism was conceived in the past, it really was a distributional issue. I mean, populists were people who stood for the people against the elite interests, which, of course, is a, continues to be a big theme of populism. But it's interesting to see that we're now in a world where we've got populism on the left and populism on the right. And that's one of the reasons why the concept is sort of protean. So uh, to go to a regional trend, um, Chavez was not alone in Latin America. He was part of a shift to the left that took place in a number of countries, uh, including elsewhere in the Andes, in Bolivia and Ecuador in particular, where you had this uh, economic populism, which is a long tradition in Latin America, where uh, there's an effort to mobilize against entrenched economic elites. But I think Lenka maybe will speak to this more, but you see this very interesting trend in Eastern Europe and in Russia now of a populism which is not on the left, but is on the right. Now it's on the right ambiguously because you also see in the Trump campaign, a kind of departure from the Ryan, more conservative, uh, you know, limits to growth kind of uh, Republicans that emphasize fiscal rectitude and shrinking the state and privatization of social security, those themes. So, so Trump kind of combined, you know, left and right uh, politics. But if we look at, I think, at Eastern Europe and Russia in particular, you see the rise of a right populism, which is anchored in an extreme nationalism, but also some of the issues that Lenka mentioned, sexuality, the church, um, and, uh, and resistance to liberalism more generally, you know, a kind of anti-NATO positioning that's, uh, that's populist. I'll stop there. I just want to pick on that for a moment, because I think it's important to note this one point that was just made in terms of uh, the relationship between populism and nationalism. So when we think of populism, we often think of this new Finn ideology idea. Um, what are populists? How do we define populists? It's mainly about being pro-people, anti-elite. Um, and what really sometimes is driving some of these democratic erosions is not the populist aspect of these parties, but it often has to do with the host ideology. So David Art had this excellent article talking about, it's not really populism, but it often is nationalism. So the populism on the right, yes, we sometimes think of these as populists because they pop, um, espouse populist rhetoric, but the underlying factors really often are nationalism or authoritarianism um, under the guise of populism, because populism uh, espouses a lot of popular ideas, um, people use this as a way of trying to categorize parties, but it's not the populism per se that is driving these these reversions. It is kind of nationalist or authoritarian tendencies or streaks that these parties also have. And I think it's important that we uh, distinguish these two factors. There's nothing inherently about populism, about um, wanting um, the people, um, disliking potentially elites, depending on, on how one goes about it. But thinking about the, the will of the people is by itself not inherently anti-democratic. Um, it is this idea of kind of what host ideology gets added on to. Um, and that more often recently has been uh, nationalism and authoritarianism. 
Yeah, no, if Anna wants to say something, but I have thoughts, but that's why. It... You can go ahead. I'll, I'll go after you. Yeah, so I, um, you know, sort of piggybacking on the ideas before, um, I always think of Eastern European populism as a combination of the West European and Latin American populism. One thing that the liberal leaders or populist leaders are excelling at, unfortunately, is um, a huge emphasis on social welfare provision and, and policies, not comprehensive policies. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is an enormous effort to increase uh, fertility, so policies that boost natality, not, not that it works, but they are trying, and policies that support what, what we call traditional families, and, you know, you know, what Fabian was saying, sort of keeping the nation, but keeping, you know, the right children. And for example, in Poland, the 500 plus, uh, uh, um, so a lot of these parties uh, increase child allowances. In Poland, the One Justice Party, the, the 500 plus Lotis program is the boost, uh, it's the biggest um, anti-child poverty program that, that Poland has ever seen. It's extremely successful. Uh, the, the Law and Justice Party always that we have been growing before. Why haven't you done this? Uh, it, it's fantastic. I mean, Orban has slightly different strategies for middle and upper middle classes to boost family policies, natality. But a huge part and very successful part of this package is an emphasis on right, you know, identity, um, national identity, but also in combination with doing everything we can to save and enhance what, what is viewed as traditional families. And these these, these welfare packages resonate with the voters big time because that's something that has been neglected and that's something that, you know, there's a reason why social democratic parties are doing so poorly in Eastern Europe. It's because the left completely, you know, siphoned out the, you know, they are the ones who are who are helping pensioners and families and and target voters in a very ruthless way. So it's a it's a fascinating hybrid and there is a huge economic component to the story as well. Just, I'll just add, just kind of building on that a little bit and looking at the Western European experience with these far right parties that have been on the rise. We've also seen this interesting shift recently where, you know, previously they were much more focused on these nationalism, nationalism issues and more purely identity based appeals. But um, recently, parties such as the National Rally in France that have been particularly successful have adopted these sort of welfare chauvinist um, platforms where they've kind of they keep their right-leaning cultural policies, but have shifted to the left on a lot of economic issues and are advocating a lot more redistribution and welfare state provision as well. But um, I think maybe a little bit in contrast to what we're seeing in Eastern Europe, they also have started sort of positioning themselves as the defenders of these liberal values. So they say that things such as um, uh, Muslim immigrants challenge these secular values that France and other Western democracies have sort of championed over the last couple of decades in terms of women's rights and things along those lines. So they've really sort of evolved even over the last decade or so to um, kind of turn their message into this actually as being defenders of liberalism, which is kind of the opposite of how we tend to think of them. Just to add one small point, and that was going back to the question of what is different now. I think one of the biggest changes we've seen when we think about uh, the populist right in particular is that historically um, radical right parties have been infighting across countries because um, if you look at the European Union, they often fail to get together a, a block because they just dis disagreed on so many issues. Uh, what we've seen in recent years really is a, a transnational right where we have the same kind of actors popping up in multiple countries, uh, links between the American far right and uh, the European far right, we see much more integration of the same people, the same playbook, uh, same playbooks, uh, much more coordination and, and kind of similar visions. And I think that is a, a big part of this resurgence as well, that we see um, something that previously because of xenophobia and maybe uh, anti-immigration policies has led to infighting, we now see new un uh, unity amongst these, these actors as well. Thank you um, for the interesting response to that question. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase one of the questions from the audience um, about backsliding in liberal democracies and the role of inequality in that, um, because it, in this the last response you were speaking, I think, um, perhaps implicitly to the the popular to this issue and the, the popularity, for example, of um, welfare policies being combined with with some other um with other issues um so is 
is a high level of inequality and or a sense that uh, that an economic elite has essentially seized hold of democracy and in kind of oligarchic tendency, uh, something that unites many of these uh, many of these movements uh, or instances of democratic erosion. Um, and this is an open open question. So I, I, I just want to say two things. Um, Kasmud and Kaltbas have an article in which they argue that the strongest far right parties are in uh, very wealthy Western European countries with generous welfare provision that are highly equal. Um, so that, you know, in a way goes against the argument that inequality and lack of welfare provision drives far right voting. But with respect to Eastern Europe, there is a huge variety. And so the, you know, the Russia and, and Ukraine very unequal. The Central Europe is not unequal. It's that just everybody is poor and miserable. So of course there is inequality, but I think a lot of it, um, if you think about the Polish case, a country that had, you know, the law and justice party won elections um, in 2015 after unprecedented economic growth in Poland. And they run on issues of inequality and their basis in the rural areas. And that's a part of the electoral package. But I think the, you know, I mean, it, it is a much more nuanced picture. And a lot of it has to do about perceptions, who's the winner and loser and what was fair and what was unfair and what was corrupt and what was uncorrupt. And for example, Orban's welfare policies, the welfare state in Hungary is horrible. But, you know, the, the people sometimes call the welfare state in Hungary as welfare for the rich. So, again, just a, a huge degree of variation. And I would be very careful. The, the, these linkages between far-right voting and equality are very, very complicated. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, did anyone else have anything they would like to add to that question? Well, I, I think one thing that we, we should be talking about is, is, is the United States in this regard, because, you know, it's obviously uh, the advanced industrial state, which has seen the largest increase in inequality over the last 20 years. But I think what's interesting is the fact that you would or you might expect that to redound to the benefit of Democrats because they typically pull better on at least some uh, bread and butter issues like uh, health care, for example, which, of course, is extremely important in terms of economic household well-being. But that hasn't proven the case, I think, in part because of the ability of Republicans to introduce and perhaps reflect other issue dimensions which are important to white working class voters. And I'd like to hear our Americanists speak on this, but I think this is probably one of the most interesting developments is uh, you know, a party which had the loyalty for generations almost of, of working class voters seeing a dramatic erosion in support from the working class and you know, increasing splits in its ranks in that regard. Thank you. And a somewhat related follow-up question from the audience about why left parties abandon support for welfareism, um, as in the U.S. and the U.K., and why social democrats have fared so poorly in uh, Western Europe. Um, again, I'm, I'm for most of these, unless I say otherwise, I'll, I'll leave this as an open question for whoever would like to contribute. So let's take that as a default policy. So I, I will start off with a little bit about the question about Western Europe in particular, which I think I know a little bit more about um, than other the rest of the question. But um, I think the general perception of what's happened to the Social Democrats in Western Europe in particular is that especially um, right around the end of the Cold War, there was this sort of enhanced emphasis on these neoliberal economic principles and both center left and center right parties sort of got on board with that idea and converged around this sort of neoliberal consensus. Um, and so these um, social democratic parties that after um, World War II were historically very embedded in these labor unions in Western Europe started moving away from their traditional voting base um, advocated these more neoliberal policies, but then at the same time, more recently have started to focus more on sort of what's called the new left. So these more 
educated, highly educated um, urban middle class, um, younger individuals and voters that they're trying to attract. Um, and in the process, they've lost a lot of their wor working class base and also um, left these working class voters to feel left behind. And so there's a lot of evidence that a lot of these working class voters that traditionally would have voted for these social democratic parties actually shifted um, to support these far right parties in Western Europe um, more recently. I think there's also one important point that recently made, needs to be made in the United States context. And that is that when we talk about working class here, we're talking about the white working class. Um, and part of that actually provides the, the explanation here is that um, the, the black minority working class, we haven't really seen that trend. And so what has happened as the Democratic Party has become a, a multiracial um, coalition, especially then also with um, more highly educated voters, what we've seen is some distancing here that is split in terms of the cultural issues. And we really see that this cultural divide has become a much starker driver. And then this has um, led to some of the erosion of traditional cleavages um, because these new cleavages have emerged as we see uh, currently discussions over critical race theory or transgender bathrooms. Those are not the traditional issues where we would think that we would see that split where you could really appeal on, on a working class basis, for instance. So it really has created new fault lines. Uh, and the reason this happens uh, in part is because we have fewer and fewer overlapping social identities in support of the political parties in the United States, but also cross-nationally. And this is uh, the idea that as different members of different social groups um, sort themselves into various parties, uh, the parties can appeal more clearly to those um, individual interests. And so in the past, we might have had um, far more variation, both in terms of rural, urban, um, uh, race, um, ideology for the two political parties in the United States. And now that we have partisans really sorted neatly into their camps, um, it really opens up a, a new set of issues to try and break into um, that distinction. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question um, related to the U.S. context. So I guess um, we'll start with you on this one, Fabian. But the extent to which um, the this election denialism is um, something that we expect to continue um, to affect U.S. elections, and then more broadly for the panel. Um, uh, the extent to which election denialism is a U.S. specific phenomenon or uh, as well as other conspiracy period, uh, theories and whether those have the extent to which those have played a role in recent developments uh, in contexts outside the United States. Yeah, so so we are at uh, an important turning point. And so the question really is what happens in the next few weeks or next few months. We'll, we'll see whether we've led to some kind of reverse with this um, election. So one thing we see already is that more candidates we might have expected have um, conceded and conceded graciously. Um, some people, today there's an interview with um, Dan Bollock in, in New Hampshire with, with Isaac Chotina in The New Yorker, where he really talks about how election denialism didn't work here. Um, and that's what, what part, of, part of why he lost, he says. And so the question will be, there's potentially an announcement late tonight of a political, of a um, of Donald Trump entering the foray again for a 2024 campaign bid. And so what will the rhetoric there be? And will that rhetoric change other people to um, maybe reverse course on having accepted the election? Um, and so I think we will see how the rhetoric shifts and how people go along with that. But I think the, the threat to 2024 is not gone. We had questions about um, the Electoral Count Act and how states might implement new laws where state legislators can overturn the result of the election and certifying their own slate of electors, that is not a thing of the past. Those things are still in the works. And so maybe uh, there will be some introspection after this election where members of the Republican Party will say, this seems to be a losing strategy. We should not focus on the election denialism. We should stop doing those things and we can go, go back to bread and butter issues. If that happens, um, things might look very different than if we see state legislators um, still moving forward with some of those um, reforms that would be anti-democratic and would potentially um, be bad for 2024. 
Uh, thank you. And I'd like to extend this question to the comparative context and, and ask the, the other panelists, you know, how the extent to which election denialism, specifically in conspiracy theories more broadly, uh, have played a role in democratic erosion uh, comparatively. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say a few words on this. I, I mean, first of all, you know, elections are central to democracy, though there was a very interesting question in the chat that I'd like to come back to, which is this question of whether you can have democracy without elections, because believe it or not, the answer to that may not be as obvious as it appears. Um, and China, for example, is advancing a conception of democracy in which elections may be less central. But I think the question of, of the role that elections play in backsliding depends very much on, on the circumstance. And what's curious about election denialism is that it typically has occurred in places where the elections actually are well managed. That's the irony. And, and by the way, this is not just the United States. This is also, for example, Brazil in which the election system is generally held as one in, uh, in which there's a high level of integrity, but Bolsonaro nonetheless had an interest in challenging the electoral system. But if we look elsewhere, there are more fundamental problems with elections, um, which include things like ex-ante measures, such as extreme gerrymandering. We have that bad in the United States and a number of states in particular, but tampering with the voter rolls uh, intimidation of voters, ballot box stuffing, vote buying. And so, you know, the, the, the series of issues, the cluster of issues around elections vary from this odd state of denying uh, elections in a system which works to those in which, you know, the electoral system really needs to be modernized and surveilled much more closely, including by international monitors. And I'll just note, I'll close on one last point that has to do with the internationalization of this question. Anna attended a very interesting conference, which we sponsored at San Diego on international organizations. And one of the things we're seeing, of course, is efforts on the part of authoritarian states to undermine the integrity of elections by monitoring them and then claiming that those elections which are fraudulent are in fact free and fair. And so there's a there's a transnational dimension to the undermining of elections, which a lot of us are concerned about, and which sometimes operates through extant international organizations. And I think Lenka knows this well, but you know, there was a big struggle with election monitoring in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, uh, centered around the OSCE organization. And the Russians have been intent on trying to undermine that monitoring by challenging those election monitoring norms and developing its own election monitoring system, where the CIS sends out monitors, the Commonwealth of Independent States sends out monitors to elections in places like Turkmenistan and says, look, these elections were great. There's no problem. So uh, there are a whole cluster of issues that surround elections beyond election denialism. And I think we just have to keep that, that in mind. Yeah, if I can just follow up, I think, you know, the way election denialism is exercised in the United States is uh, exceptional <laughs> and special. And I, I cannot think of, you know, anything to that sort in, in Eastern Europe. However, what's important in Eastern Europe are fraudulent elections and by fraudulent, objectively fraudulent elections. That was behind the uh, Orange Revolution 2009, uh, Tulip Revolution, Kyrgyzstan, Rose Revolution in Georgia. So you see mass mobilization after accusations of electoral fraud. So that has that's an important focal point and actually in the, in the positive direction in this way. When it comes to conspiracy theories, I think uh, if they have, it's very difficult to pin this down, but certainly um, the way this is, you know, it's a sort of a new form of anti-Semitism. So there are some overlapping themes, but certainly in, when we think about replacement conspiracies and um, the issues of, you know, how the, the composition of the population is going to look, look like, there's a conspiracy that uh, Soros is behind the, the great replacement, which of course means that Soros is, you know, bringing Muslims to 
Europe to dilute, and that's sometimes the language that the far right uses, dilute the blood of the nation. So we see it in, we see it in, in public protests. That there's, there's like a really blood blood related references in, in some of these protests, and that's that's linked. Orban has used it. Other people are using it as this global Soros glo global conspiracy about bringing in migrants that are in, racially incompatible with the domestic population in order to decrease the, 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 the racial quality and to, to dilute the blood. So, um, but again, it's, you know, the research on conspiracy theories is very difficult, but it's very important, certainly. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions in the from the audience surrounding uh, globalization um, and anti-globalization. Um, and, I'm going to try and combine two of them. So uh, there's a question about how with it seems like globalization is going to only increase. So how is that then going to uh, likely impact uh, this trend in democratic erosion? And in particular, um, whether shrinking or restructured um, domestic coalitions could um, then cause a backlash against globalization. Um, and I guess we'll start with Dr. Meyer Rose for this one. I think that's uh, more in your wheelhouse there. Yeah, um, so I think part of my response to that question would be that um, it seems that kind of going back to something I said earlier, that really the way that governments might need to address these grievances that are arising due to globalization moving forward is um, kind of going back to what in, you know, decades past was a lot of literature on compensation and this idea of embedded liberalism where governments are expected to sort of provide um, welfare provisions and other protections um, to protect their citizens that are negatively impacted by globalization and by these trade shocks and things along those lines to sort of um, balance out the economic consequences for those, um, you know, quote unquote, losers of globalization. Um, and so I think, assuming that globalization does continue um, moving forward, it might have to be a slight adjustment in that we don't have these completely um, open, you know, open pol economic policies for all governments in which anything goes and this sort of race to the bottom with respect to protections and taxation and things along those lines and instead readjusting a bit to provide those um, protections for those workers and other individuals that are um, negatively impacted by the global economy in particular. Yeah, this is a, this is an extremely interesting question, and I, I think uh, it has it has two somewhat different components to me. You know, one is our voters who are adversely affected by globalization, and there's no doubt that there are voters that are adversely affected by globalization. Are they more likely to support populist parties or populist candidates? You know, I think that's an interesting question. We have some evidence uh, to the effect that that's that is true. Um, but then there's the other question about whether the backlash against globalization is necessarily anti-democratic or even irrational. And in my humble opinion, it's not. You know, this is, uh, you know, an open world economy is not something we should necessarily take for granted. You can imagine parties differing in the extent to which they would like to see a more or less open economy. And I also think that the premise of the question is worth discussion as well. It's not entirely clear to me that trends towards globalization are, in fact, going to march ahead at the same pace. And it's extremely interesting that the Trump administration was criticized very heavily for the trade war with China, which was left unresolved at the end of his administration. Yet the Biden administration has come into office and actually not done very much to dismantle the Trump era tariffs. Uh, in fact, you know, the vast majority of those tariffs are still in place. And, uh, and it doesn't seem like we're on a path that they're, in fact, will be lowered, despite the fact that they would have quite obvious inflation reducing effects, maybe marginal, but nonetheless, that the margin matters, you know, when you have inflation of this magnitude. So they're, they're just a very interesting cluster of issues around this question that I don't think we have full answers to yet. Thank you. 
Um, uh, there's a question that sort of continues in this vein about uh, whether this trend in backsliding will actually uh, potentially result in uh, a shift in the sort of global architecture uh, or the existing global order. So if we have uh, essentially enough democratic erosion or backsliding, especially um, in in major countries, whether that will will have what the, some of the international effects, ripple effects will be there. Uh, and I'll, this one is. Yeah, um, so I can build on some of what I was started with earlier to kind of kick this one off. Um, I think kind of we're seeing more and more of this sort of these nationalism as to the extent that backsliding continues and that it continues to often um, have these parallels with these um, populist nationalists, um, candidates and leaders that are in these backsliding states. Um, assuming that this, the trends do continue, I would say that yes, we can expect to see changes in the international system. Um, that workshop that Steph mentioned that we had just a couple of weeks ago at UCSD has a lot of um, people doing this really great work on how um, these backsliding states, in addition to um, more established autocracies like Russia and China, behave within um, these international organizations. So um, historically, we've seen that China and Russia and um, these more established autocracies um, tend to oppose a lot of initiatives at the international level, such as efforts to protect human rights and other liberal values that we associate with the current international system. Um, but there seems to be some evidence that these backsliding states might behaving, be behaving in this way in general. And so we might expect that as they reach sort of a critical mass of not just these closed autocracies, but this growing number of backsliding states that we have these much more illiberal preferences that we might see a shift in um, sort of the values and norms that are um, sort of the foundation of the global system. And that would be a big shift from what we've had basically since the end of World War II. Thank you. Anyone, did anyone else want to add on to uh, Dr. Meyer Rose's response? So, you know, I think it's possible that backsliding is a wave. I think the international community and factors are incredibly important. I think um, everybody watched the US elections very, very closely, and it really does matter, um, you know, who is in charge in the White House. And I think it has implications. And I, I think uh, this election was really important. And of course, you know, we'll see the presidential election. So, um, you know, I think the fact that uh, Russia will emerge beaconed from this horrible conflict that is very important so i think that also might contribute to to the maybe the end of the backsliding wave and it doesn't mean that we are going to enter a blizz i mean i think we will just enter an era of, of uh, imperfect democracies which i think is normal and uh, you know, not not things that we shouldn't worry about, but it seems to me that's how normal world operates. So you go up and down. And I just want to, one last thing, follow up. You know, backsliding in a lot of the Eastern European countries, backsliding happened, and then the countries fought back, and they, and then they elected a set of pro-democratic leaders. And now in Bulgaria, GERP is back, and maybe they will get rid of GERP. And uh, you know, Slovakia had a horrible episode of backsliding in, you know, under Mechior, and then they fought back and now they have problems. So to me, you know, I wrote this article in Suburbing. I really think that there is a there is a wave, and I think we have seen a horrible wave, but I think sort of we might end up in a plateau with some oscillations around, you know, more palatable and less palatable leaders. Um, yeah, I really, I really like that answer, and I like the way that this focuses a little bit on on some of the regional variations. So let me introduce a mildly more pessimistic, you know, take. Um, not on on that region because I think Lenka has, has spelled out very neatly the way that you can get reactions against backsliding at the political level where democracy is on the ballot and people vote for it. But I do think there's something implicit in what Anna said that bears paying in mind, which is that we now have these two you know, major powers that are deeply authoritarian. And one of them is in the process of being very significantly discredited, but the other isn't yet. 
And I think that um, you know China is not only fighting for influence within existing international institutions, it's also trying to shape a narrative about the dysfunctionality of Western democracy. And so there was a question in the chat, which you know might seem like an obvious question, but I can't remember who the, the, the questioner was, but they asked, is it possible to have democracy without elections? And of course, the five of us would say, no, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. You know, you can't have a, a, a democracy without elections because that's the defining feature of democracy. But the Chinese, in fact, are advancing exactly that idea, which is that the Chinese Communist Party represents the interests of the people of China, that elections and democracy are just messy and you know, incompetent and pointing to the United States, pointing to other examples of dysfunction and making the argument that there's, there's a positive case to be made for a more restrained type of rule. And you know, interestingly, again, Asia was sort of the leader in this because you had a government in Singapore, which is extraordinarily technocratically competent, generated unparalleled growth over long periods of time, and has maintained itself as you know, essentially a one-party dominant system. So those narratives are out there. And I think some of the new illiberalism on the right is not just challenging what center left parties have done, but they're challenging democracy more deeply and saying it may not be the optimal system. Thank you. Um, that I think I'm gonna try and make a tie in between your last comment, Dr. Haggard, and uh, one of the questions in the chat, which asks about the US context and whether we're we're stuck in this sort of Republican democratic tribalism. And I'm also wondering as sort of a corollary, corollary to that, uh, and this is for Dr. Neuner as well, but as a corollary to that, um, the extent to which this, this sort of extreme polarization between parties in two party systems feeds into this Chinese um, narrative that, of democracy as being something uh, more dysfunctional. Um, so perhaps if either one of you wants to take us away. Well, I'll start off with, with the first part, and that is um, once social identities become very entrenched, they, they are hard to, to undo, and especially because these social identities in the United States are just so sorted, um, and we have so little overlap between the parties. And that was what historically really allowed for ties between members of different parties was they could see commonalities. And we actually know that those interventions that can get Democrats and Republicans to see each other uh, more as individuals and, and less as their prototypical groups are really those that can reduce effective polarization, that can increase trust between the parties or partisans. And so I think on the one hand, these groups are going to stay for a very long time, especially because they have now sorted into this equilibrium where we have um, different social groups very well aligned with various parties. So we have African Americans aligned with the Democratic Party. We have evangelical, white evangelicals aligned with the Republican Party. But this goes further and further. This is seeped into cultural preferences. And really, on, on most dimensions that we think structure American life, we see some kind of polarization on these, on these social dimensions. So I think that that is that is here to stay. Now, the question is, can you see fractures within this sometimes? So uh, new research, for instance, shows that you have a distinction between Republicans who see themselves as MAGA Republicans and Republicans who see themselves as non-MAGA Republicans. And they have vastly different views on questions about democratic norms, for instance, and um, the transition of power. And so what might happen is which group within a social identity becomes dominant. And, and that is mainly driven by elite rhetoric and elite leadership. And so uh, these, these social groups move very, potentially very quickly they stay um, coherent, but within the group, you might see movement if kind of group norms shift or group leadership um, takes a new tone. And so even though I think the groups Democratic and Republican uh, will stay for a very long time, uh, what it means to be a Democrat or Republican could change, and that might have implications for um, Democratic backsliding. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Can I just follow up what, what Fabian said very briefly? I think if 
there are groups that will save democracy in, in, in Eastern Europe, maybe elsewhere. These are moderate social conservatives. So when, whenever you know you see very often that the illiberals are ousted, of course not by progressives because they are small and uh, just toothless and discredited, um, at least in Eastern Europe, but moderate conf moderate confessional voters who vote for right wing patriotic parties that are willing to stay within the confines of democracy. That's the force that will save democracy, not the left, but the moderate right. Yeah, I think I think we're I think we're coming to the end of our time here shortly, but I, I would just really endorse this this focus. It's going to just be really interesting to watch what happens within the Republican Party over the next coming weeks and months. Uh, it's pretty clear that there are battle lines being formed around wings of that party. And, you know, conservative parties are just an essential feature of uh, liberal democracy. They, they need to function and not choose an authoritarian path. And uh, we're going to see this debate played out starting tonight uh, in the Republican Party about what its, uh, what its chosen path is going to be moving forward. Thank you. I think we are running out of time, but I want to wrap up with one final question um, directed at, um, at Lenka about, you know, you had mentioned that Hungary has been this exception where we've seen um, democratic erosion uh, continue, whereas in other Eastern European cases, there has been a pushback. Um, and I'm wondering what lessons Hungary gives us in terms of um, what what makes this democratic erosion stick um, in that particular case? Or, or, Orban was uh, lucky uh, in 2010, and it's unicameralism, majoritarianism, uh, capture of uh, conservative groups, um, and um, you know, I I think I might be wrong, but I think Hungary might prove be the exception to the rule, but. Yeah, but de definitely there are some institutional features uh, and maybe ethnic homogeneity, uh, lack of fragmentation. There, there might be some institutional features of the electoral system in Hungary that allow this. And sometimes when you see these foundational victories, they're so thin. That sometimes these guys just get lucky and they, they win just, just enough and then they lock it in. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. As I mean, you know, backsliding governments don't necessarily enjoy electoral majorities. I mean, this is this is something which is an illusion. You know, it's yeah, well put. Yeah. We are about out of time. Um, I want to thank all the presenters and participants. Um, and if anyone would like to sort of a takeaway comments um, before we take off, uh, open the floor for that. Well, I'll start by passing. It was a great discussion. I really enjoyed that you uh, pulled this together and look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, for a productive thank discussion. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again at a future event. We'll have some more exciting things planned. So, yeah. Thank right. you so much. Thank it was you. A pleasure. Bye. It was amazing. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Ciao.